<clears throat> so we're starting just a few minutes. Um, just a, uh, some small information about the webinar. So today we're going to talk again about ceramic additive manufacturing. So for those who have followed us um, through our previous webinar, you know that this is obviously a, a strong focus of the company. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about use cases. So I'm still going to talk a bit about uh, the technology first, uh, but the, the main uh, interest for us will be to uh, discuss a bit um, uh, about applications and use cases to give you some examples of what can be done with uh, our Zetamix technology. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, you can obviously ask them. The best way to do that is to use the Q&R uh, um, uh, section. Uh, if you look on, on the bottom of the screen, you'll see that uh, you have um, uh, a, a section specifically for questions. It will be um, to make sure that we see them and try to answer them at the end of the presentation. If you just post them in the chat, it may be lost a bit uh, with some other information. So it's, it's better if you can post them on the Q&R section. And obviously I will try to answer these. At the end of the presentation, um, I'll try to answer these questions. If you have any other topics you would like to discuss, you can of course contact us. Uh, we will send the slides, so don't uh, don't worry. You you will receive them. No need to uh, um, uh, write everything down, um, and we will probably contact you to um, uh, offer a call or a, a video conference uh, directly with you in the coming weeks to discuss on your potential projects on ceramic additive manufacturing. So let's start. I'm sure the late comments will uh, uh, be arriving now so we can, uh, we can start. So, as I told you, today we're go going to talk specifically about ceramic additive manufacturing by FDM process. Uh, of course, there are other technologies. We already organized a, a webinar on, on a benchmark of different technologies, which are all really relevant and, and interesting, but we are really going to focus on this technology, which is uh, one of the main um, uh, product in 3D printing for nano -E. Um, a few words about the company uh, to start. Um, something that we really want to focus on is uh, to explain you who we are and what we are doing in 3D printing. Uh, get, I'm, I'm repeating again for those who were uh, there at the previous webinars, but uh, we still find some people who um, have not uh, yet uh, heard about this. Nanoe, we are not a machine manufacturer, we are a raw material producer. So uh, we, we've been producing for more than 10 years ceramic raw materials uh, and we really come from that industry. Uh, our interest in 3D printing is mainly in the raw materials. So what do we do? We produce ceramic powders and ceramic powders transformed for different kind of process. All of them are uh, usually oxide materials, the main ones being alumina, zirconia, and composites of alumina and zirconia. And these uh, raw materials are produced in industrial scale, uh, typically a batch is one to two ton. Um, we do have a strong focus on ready to use materials, which explains our activity in 3D printing, and I'll come back to that. Um, but this is something really important for us, and obviously, uh, uh, some uh, strong focus on innovation, uh, developing new products, usually with customers, and developing materials for 3D printing. So, so again, we are not only making materials for 3D printing. Uh, uh, we've been acting for, uh, I think it's 
12 years now and the 3D printing is a latest addition to our product range. Uh, we started uh, materials for 3D printing uh, as a commercial activity uh, two years ago. So for more than 10 years, we were only selling products for pressing, casting, and ingression molding of ceramics. And we added 3D printing. What's, <coughs> what's interesting to understand is that whatever the process you are using, 3D printing or any other uh, shaping process in ceramic, uh, it always uh, has the same function, which is to, to produce uh, the shape of the parts you want to obtain, but you always need a sintering, a thermal treatment afterwards uh, to obtain uh, a dense ceramic material with the, the kind of properties you are looking for. So when you switch to the printing uh, instead of another process, uh, this does not make such a big change for industrial manufacturer of ceramics. They are already used to the typical problems you have with uh, the binding and sintering, uh, typically uh, shrinkage issues and uh, uh, dimension tolerances and so on is something that ceramic manufacturers are very familiar with. So these products are used in quite a few industries. Here are some of the, the biggest ones. Uh, <clears throat> semiconductors, medical, wear parts, uh, which are the three main ones, and then some applications in aesthetical parts, uh, aerospace, and fluid handling. Any kind of application where you do need high performance ceramic, I call it so. High performance ceramics means high temperature, high wear resistance, high corrosion resistance, uh, biocompatibility, of course. Uh, uh, these are the properties of the material we, we offer. So let's go now to 3D printing. What's, what's our uh, business in 3D printing? What do we do? Again, uh, I, I repeat again, uh, we're a material manufacturer. So when we started uh, working in 3D printing, uh, our objective was to develop materials which are compatible with machines that are already on the market. If you look closely at the picture here, this uh, is uh, a picture of a printer where you can see the brand of the printer we're using, uh, which is very 3D. Um, really, our objective in 3D printing is to supply raw materials for existing machines on the market. So we started with FDM. There might be some other developments for SLA on, and, and different technologies. But we started with FDM because this was very close to our traditional uh, business and especially to ceramic injection molding feedstocks. So what do we actually do? We, we do two things at Nanui on top of preparing the powder. Uh, once we have a powder, a ceramic powder, we will mix it with thermoplastic binders and then we will extrude it uh, to make a filament out of it. There's a few uh, tricky things here. It seems quite simple, but that's actually something very, very complex. Uh, because uh, being able to, to make some, uh, mix a compound of, uh, of uh, powder and, uh, and thermoplastic binders with very high loading of uh, powder is quite complex. Um, and then extruding a very highly loaded uh, filament is also something quite complex. So there's a lot of know-how here. There's also a few patents on the formulation of our filaments. Uh, this is really where the core uh, of our competencies uh, are in, in the formulation of the binders and the, the mixing process and extrusion process. So uh, what are the materials available? We started with something quite obvious with our own raw materials for alumina, zirconia, black and white, which are typical products from Nanui. And there's one thing which is quite uh, new for us uh, is that we decided uh, this year uh, to launch a, a metal filament, so a 316L a stainless steel filament, which works exactly in the same principle, except that, well, obviously we don't produce the powder. We buy it and we mix it with our binders. <coughs> so how does that work afterwards? How do you print a part using our process? Uh, well, it's a mainly three-step process. So obviously you have preparation before and then the, the, 
three main steps are printing, debinding, and sintering. Uh, I'll go back in details afterwards, but so printing will give you the shape and precision of the part, the surface finish, the green density, and then the binding will allow you to remove part of the binder. Um, the thermal debinding and sintering will give you the rest of the uh, of uh, the debinding, so you remove all of the binder and you will densify the part. I'll go back in details again. Once you have a final part, obviously you can make some post-processing, uh, polishing, some blasting, whatever. Well, the first step is uh, file preparation. Uh, one of the interesting uh, thing of having what we call an open system, that means we make raw materials, but we don't make the machine, it means we can use a lot of different platforms for machines, but also for slicers, for softwares. Um, so here we have a software, which is uh, um, the one from uh, Ray's 3D, which is called ID Maker, but we could also use some other slicer, Cura, uh, uh, or um, I'm thinking also about uh, uh, Simplify 3D, which is uh, next in slicer. So depending on what you want to print and the complexity of the part, you can use different softwares. The software is basically going to do one thing. It's going to take a part, a 3D file, and transform it into a set of instructions for the printer. So here, I'm not sure you see it, it's not very clear, but it has been transformed into this set of instructions, and we can see the layers uh, on, on that part. It is also in the slicer uh, at that step, uh, actually at that step, that we will compensate for shrinkage. So uh, Nano will provide uh, guidelines for using the filaments in, in those guidelines, you have an oversizing factor uh, that you need to apply if you want to have the final dimensions of your part. Once you have a file prepared, you actually put it on a USB stick. It's quite simple. You go to your printer and you print. So how does that work? Uh, uh, FDM printing is uh, a technology that has been developed for thermoplastics. The, the, the material is in the form of spools of filaments uh, and the filament is being pushed through a heated nozzle. Uh, it will melt in the nozzle and be deposited in a melted uh, liquid phase and by cooling down uh, you solidify the part uh, and you can add layer by layer. We usually use two head printers, which allows to use a support material of a different material. That's something quite important for us. Um, it, it allows to save materials and sometimes uh, also to make uh, different parts. Once you have print, printed, you go to the really crucial part of the process, which is the binding. So what we've printed is actually uh, a composite part. You have a, a pattern, a ceramic or metal, and you have some thermoplastic binders, and we need to remove those thermoplastic binders. Usually you have two types of binders, soluble binders and backbone. The soluble binders uh, will dissolve in a solvent, and the backbone will stay uh, until the, the heat treatment. So once you've printed, you will first do what we call a chemical debinding. You put the part in a solvent bath, uh, for us, it's acetone, uh, and once uh, the acetone has dissolved the soluble binder, you then take out the part, dry it, and put it in a furnace. And in the furnace, you will paralyze or burn the rest of the binder and sinter the part. What happens during sintering is you, you well, you densify the part. You get to densities of 99% for ceramic. Uh, and 90 to 95 for metals. Obviously, that means the porosity has to go somewhere or the material has to go somewhere if you do it the other way. Anyway, uh, you can't have a, a densification without having a shrinkage of your part. So the part will shrink very significantly. We're talking of 15 to 20 percent shrinkage, which is, which is very uh, significant, which has an, an impact on uh, precision uh, you can reach. It has an impact of a lot of things. Uh, it, can, it can lead to deformation. It is really one of the tricky parts in, in this process and something that needs to be controlled. 
what are the key benefits of this technology of Zetamix? The, the main two benefits is this is a technology that makes ceramic and metal printing easy and affordable. Uh, easy to use because it's a very simple system. The training time is, uh, uh, is quick. We, we train customers in one day. Um, uh, it can be placed in the hands of uh, trained technician, you do, don't need very advanced uh, um, uh, training to do that. Um, there's not so much problems of health and safety, safety because you, you're not manipulating powders. So that makes it really the easiest way to print ceramic and metal. It's also um, a relatively low investment cost technology uh, because FDM printers are, let's say, a commonplace now. Uh, so printers, very efficient printers are available for a reasonable price. And we do offer at Nanoway um, a printing kit with printer, debining, and sintering furnace, uh, starting at 10,000 euros. Again, we're not machine manufacturers, so we just buy and resell, but we do offer a system uh, for printing, debining, and sintering parts. This is really something unique. You don't have any other technology on the market where you can manufacture complex parts of ceramic and metal at that price. And talking about printing or machining or whatever technology, you will not find any equivalent. <clears throat> That's the two main things. Apart from that, we can also say that it is quite versatile. With the same printer, you can print obviously plastics, uh, ceramic and metal parts, and we are developing quite a few uh, all the ceramic and metal filaments uh, that will come in the next uh, months and years. And lastly, the accuracy of the printing. Obviously, it's, it's not the best if you compare it with SLA. SLA is more precise, but it is still surprisingly good. Uh, we did a lot of tests in this on what kind of repeatability and accuracy we could have on relatively big parts for, for ceramic, for technical ceramics. And we see that we do manage to get to precisions of plus minus 0.1 millimeter, even on parts up to 10 centimeters, eight to 10 centimeters, which is for a ceramic, uh, technical ceramic material, relatively good. Uh, it also has the possibility to print close porosities, hollow structures, uh, small channels also, because you, you will actually directly print uh, the porosities, you don't have any support material inside, which, which makes, uh, makes it uh, advantageous, of course. A, a quick benchmark of the technologies I was saying. We do consider, when we talk about additive manufacturing of technical ceramics, we usually consider four technologies, final jetting, inkjet, SLA, and FDM. I'm not going to detail everything, but I would say SLA is the, the, the mainstream technology at the moment. It's very mature. There's a few players. It is a very accurate technology. It makes dense ceramic, but it is quite expensive and, and relatively slow to print. Uh, FDM will give you lowest accuracy and especially surface finishes are, are a bit rougher, uh, but still relatively good. And you will also have again dense ceramics relatively good speed of printing uh, and the cost is uh, obviously very different. Anyway, for us, these technologies do not compete. We feel that every technology is ad adapted to some use cases. And we even see some customers who are actually equipped with several of these technologies, usually FDM and SLA, uh, because depending on the part they want to produce, they will choose one or the other technology. What are the typical applications? We'll go into details afterwards, so I'm not going to spend too much time detailing, but we do see a lot, a lot of applications, both for ceramic and metal, for tooling applications. So uh, let's say uh, internal parts, parts that you are going to print to use internally in-house and not to sell a product out of. With ceramic, we do have a few customers making uh, technical parts uh, which are actually for final products and also a bit of prototyping, of course. 
And then we are going to uh, go to some examples of use cases, which is really uh, uh, what we wanted to focus on uh, today. So I have uh, a total of 10 different use cases to present. So I'm probably going to go quite uh, fast on some of these. If you have questions again, you can ask them and I will try to answer at the end. The first example of application is a uh, um, uh, use case we, we found out about uh, thanks to the European synchrotron, which is based in Grenoble. So a, syn a synchrotron is uh, basically a particle accelerator, which is used for analyzing materials uh, or all kinds of samples. Uh, so we, we are not at all uh, into the, the part which is actually the particle accelerator, but uh, they are using our technology a lot for what we call sample environment. So basically, these samples are analyzed usually in very wide range of temperatures, starting at minus uh, 270 degrees C up to 1200 degrees C. So you need material that can withstand this range of temperature. Um, uh, which can be used as sample holders, heating element holders, some parts to, to inject a gas, a reactant, uh, anything that is needed around the, the sample. Uh, it's a lot of small parts on demand, not necessarily complex, it depends. So quite often it's just a simple part, but you need one, two or five of this, this part, and then you go to a new experiment, and so you need a different part a lot of small on-demand parts, which is exactly uh, one of the best use cases for, for additive manufacturing. Um, <coughs> so here are some details about these applications. The first uh, part on, on the top is a, a, a ceramic heating uh, cartridge or a, a, a heating element holder, holder. So they actually print the ceramic part and then it sets inside of it a heating element. Uh, which makes a heating cartridge, and that kind of cartridge can go up to 12, 1300 degrees Celsius. Uh, so you obviously need a material that has uh, temperature resistance, electrical resistance, uh, and that's uh, where uh, Zetamix can be useful. There's also some sample holders, again, with high temperature needs and sometimes low heat conductivity. And for some uh, projects, they are also looking at more complex parts. On the bottom corner, you have uh, a micro furnace uh, with also a, a double jacket and some uh, water cooling uh, inside, inside this piece. If we go really in details uh, to focus on two of the advantage of the technology, the sample holders, uh, actually the, the photos are mixed. Anyway, uh, the sample holders, uh, really what they were looking for is more reactivity. We need the part as soon as possible. It's usually because they need to replace a part that is missing or that is not uh, acceptable because it's not in the right material, let's say. Uh, and you usually need that part very fast, say one day, two days maximum. And uh, on the heat, the, the, for the heating cartridges, that's a bit different. They could buy standard cartridge already assembled. But the interest here is to have custom size and shapes, and also to make some cost savings. That kind of cartridge can be quite expensive. Uh, they use a lot of them, so that, that's an interest. A second example of application, unfortunately, I can't give any names of customers. I won't be able to show a lot of parts also because that's uh, most of the case uh, confidential, but uh, uh, ceramic materials and especially ceramic 3D printing uh, can be used a lot for telecommunications, for printing to, to make it clear for printing antennas. Um, why? Because uh, there's a need for geometrical design, complex geometrical design, some of them being not possible to produce with traditional process. You need relatively high precision and some small details and obviously you need a what we call a direct material, a material with permittivity and no loss. Um, here you have one example of part, it's almost the only one we can uh, show, uh, which is um, um, some experiments made on the 5G antennas. Um, so here uh, the part is 
not that complex, but still to manufacture in another process, that would be quite complex. Uh, and we needed zirconia because zirconia is a good dielectric material with a, uh, a permittivity of roughly 25. It does depend uh, uh, on publications, let's say, but the, the, the rough value is 20 to 30 and a, a very low loss, which is also very important for uh, that kind of application. And so it can be used for high speed production of all type of antennas uh, for 5G, SATCOM, any kind of telecommunications. Um, obviously, this is a, a passive uh, part, and on, on, on the bottom of it, you would have the active part of the, uh, the communication uh, area. Uh, third example, third application. Uh, we're really trying to give you a wide uh, range of applications with the different properties you will find in ceramics and different type of applications. Here, yeah, the, the customer is Avignon Ceramic. It's a name you're going to see quite a few times because that was one of the early adopters of our uh, technology and they do sell quite a few parts made with Zetamix. Um, so here it's a spray nozzle. You'll see what we mean by that on the next uh, slides. Basically, the customer needs a high wear resistant uh, tool and uh, they need small series with different sizes, angles, shapes uh, of this uh, of these tools, uh, these tools are uh, uh, usually made to uh, uh, carry some corrosive uh, material or some abrasive material. One of the typical thing is would be sandblasting uh, nozzles or that kind of things. A typical size can be quite long, ten to almost twenty centimeter, uh, and so we use alumina for these kind of applications. Alumina or zirconia, both can be used. Um, to produce small series of that kind of uh, parts in less than a week. But again, if, if you need high volume of those parts, there may be other technologies, but if you need 50, 100 of these parts, the most efficient way to make them is probably to print them. And the wear resistance of ceramic compared to other material is so, so much better that you will really yield better results. Um, another example of application is uh, some custom impellers for ink preparation and ceramic slurry preparation. Uh, this is something we started to do for internal uses, and now we've also find a few customers interested in that, but the, the first trials were, were done uh, for Nanoe. Uh, we needed uh, custom made impellers with specific shape and specific sizes. Uh, above all, and we wanted a material that would not oxidize and will not wear down um, <coughs> to avoid product pollution. Uh, so we replaced the part that you can see on the bottom corner, which is uh, stainless steel with a ceramic part, uh, actually printed in, in two slices because it was more simple to print, uh, which allowed us to choose the design and to have the, the impeller made in zirconia, which is very wear resistant and also corrosion resistant. It, it gives savings on both cost, time, and also some increased performance. Another use case from Avignon, this one. Um, here, the application is in aerospace, um, which is the, the main market from Avignon. They have a few customers who need high temperature flow flow sensors which are parts which are completely impossible to manufacture by traditional ceramic process. I'll show you why. Here you have an example of how that technology works. Uh, it's, it's quite simple. It's a probe where you will have um, um, uh, some holes and some uh, channels going from the front of the part and from the, the, the sides of the part. Um, on the printed parts, you can see one of those channels uh, if you look carefully um, and uh, it allows you to measure both static and dynamic pressure and by making the difference between the two of them you can have the, the speed of the, uh, the, the gas, the airflow. Usually it's made in metal and in metal it's quite simple, you actually assemble, you weld, you can do a lot of things. 
problem in ceramics is you can't assemble, you can't weld, and this part cannot be injected or pressed or milled or whatever because you have internal channels with several uh, uh, changing directions, and this is not something you can make by any traditional process. Why, why make it in ceramic? Because, because sometimes you need high temperature. Here, the idea was to actually put that probe uh, in the exhaust gas of a, uh, of a, a turbine. Uh, and so the heat is very high and you need a material that resists to that kind of heat. Printing also allows you to make a, a very complex part. So you can put one, two, several holes. Here, here it's a different design, but same principle. And here is the same design, but uh, with some quality checking uh, uh, by dye inspection. So you can make more complex designs. You can see here that they added uh, what we call a honeycomb structure, which is better for thermal shock. Uh, it allows to cool a bit uh, the ceramic uh, from the inside. Again, an application from ceramic application, from Avignon ceramic. Um, which is some foundry filters uh, in high precision foundry and especially for aerospace applications. Uh, all of the metal which is being casted is filtrated to remove impurities. And so you need a material that withstands that kind of temperature and that allows the, the, the metal, the liquid metal, to go through, uh, if possible, with a high flow. Um, and um, um, and you need to remove as much as possible the impurities and avoid adding more. Usually these uh, parts are made by making ceramic foams, uh, but this brings some issues such as uh, uh, the flow is not very well controlled, the porosity is not very well controlled, and you can have some pollution coming from the filter because it, it, it can have some brittle portions. Um, by printing it, you can choose to replace so the foam that you can see here, you can replace it with controlled structures. So you can choose the size of uh, the holes you want. You can choose the percentage of porosity you have, the, the, um, the thickness of the walls so that you know exactly if it's strong enough or not. You can really adapt completely your design to what uh, um, uh, the customer need. So that, that makes it uh, a more complex, uh, more complex parts. You can add some more uh, information, some more uh, uh, function into it. Typically you can uh, choose the, the outside shape of the, of the part, which can sometimes be useful. The objective being obviously to make uh, a, a field so that can reduce pollution in the final product and we, which will improve the flow uh, through, the, through the filter. That kind of approach can also be used, obviously, for catalysis, for other kind of filtration, uh, any kind of application where you need to control an, um, a porous structure. Another example of application, uh, here it's uh, some spare parts. So we worked with a company who is specialized in providing spare parts for the textile industry, which is called Petit Spare Parts. It's a French, a French company. Uh, so they basically they provide thread guides and all, all kinds of uh, wear parts uh, for textile industry. But in most cases, uh, they actually work with traditional process. They have stock of uh, spare parts and they just deliver these. Uh, but they do also have uh, very often uh, incoming uh, requirements for small volumes. Someone who has a specific spare part, something that doesn't exist a lot on the market, which can't find any replacement part, who needs one, two, five, ten parts maybe. Uh, this is not something you can answer to uh, with pressing or injection molding. It's going to be uh, too expensive because of the mold cost. So you need a technology which is reactive, you can act quite, quite quickly, which obviously produce wear, wear parts or wear resistant parts with a high surface quality. Um, so this is the kind of part we printed for this uh, customer. We printed them in Zikonia because we 
can obtain very uh, good surface finish by making some uh, post-processing, but it's also very wear resistant. And we can have such a part in, let's say, a maximum one week. And again, the size and the design can be very easily adapted. So you need one part like that, and the next one you need, I don't know, uh, two more holes, no problem. That's very fast, easy to do. It's very much efficient for small volume on-demand production of spare parts. <clears throat> Another example of application, uh, we do have a few customer requirements for printing burners. But the parts I'm gonna show is not actually a customer part because we can't show these. Either it's a part we, we printed as a demo part. The idea here is what, what does a customer need? He needs a high temperature part, of course, and he needs to be able to uh, make quite complex shapes and to tailor make the product to have the, the best possible flame. The burning efficiency of the flame must be uh, very good. You sometimes want to direct the flame in a certain way. Uh, there's a lot of things you may want to do uh, where you need quite complex parts with internal structures and you can't make that by traditional process. Well, the part we printed is an example. Uh, it's a venturi burner, so you actually have a channel which would bring gas through the middle of a, of a venturi uh, 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 shape. Uh, and so you just uh, ignite it and the flow of gas will also uh, uh, generate a flow of air and so a good mix of air and, uh, um, and uh, in that case a simple plus propane or butane of propane, I can't remember. Anyway, inflammable gas. The interest of printing this in alumina is alumina can withstand up to 1800 degrees C, which means except if you really go to high temperature, you don't need to add any cooling circuit, so you can uh, simplify your design a bit. And again, you can print on demand uh, specific complex parts with internal channels, one, two, three set of channels. Uh, that's, that's something which is very efficient. Uh, and it is obviously uh, quite uh, efficient in terms of price and time, especially if you're doing small volumes. So you can see the part uh, uh, doing the burn and you can see that it, it works quite well. <coughs> uh, one of the last example of applications, um, we do have a few customers who are using our materials with traditional process, so mainly pressing and injection molding, which obviously want to keep that as an industrial process, but who are always looking for more efficient way to do prototyping. Uh, typically, if you launch a new product um, by ceramic injection molding, the investment in mold is gonna be five to 20, more in the 10 to 20 thousand euro for, for a new mold. So before you get there, you need to validate your design. You need to be completely sure that you have a good design. So that's where 3D printing uh, can be useful. Obviously there are other prototyping methods, but 3D printing is a very quick, easy to use, low cost way of making those prototypes. Here you have examples of part that we have printed uh, for a customer. Unfortunately, <coughs> you can't give any names. Um, but that allows you to test a new design quite quickly. Uh, and usually it's black and white sequin that I use for this. You do need some, some finishing steps, but that's something which is acceptable for our customers. They say, okay, it's a bit more difficult to finish. It's possible, it's a bit more longer, but for prototyping, that's completely acceptable. And that allows to iterate a lot more quickly than we would do if you were to design a mold or do something else. And so you can test a lot more designs before choosing which is the last and the final design you want to select. Um, some similar uh, use case, except here it's for a uh, final part. We have been asked uh, more and more to, uh, to see if our technology can be used for final parts for aesthetical applications, so jewelry, but also Again, uh, watch industry and some other 
um, accessories that could be made in ceramics. <coughs> the interest here is again production of tailor made uh, jewels. You can adapt the size, you can adapt the shape, you can adapt everything. You can add some uh, any patterns you want, uh, typically coat of arm, initials, whatever. Um, um, and, and you can also have a very new and different business model where you actually uh, typically would, would offer these kind of jewels uh, on the internet um, and, and offer a very wide variety of designs without, without having the need for stocks. You can print the part on demand. One, once you have the order, you will print the bind center and polish to get to the, the jewel that, that you have ordered. You can also even leave the, the customer uh, the possibility to design his own uh, jewel if, if, if he wants. So that's really something that, that can completely change the way uh, this business is traditionally run with high stocks, uh, limited numbers of collections, because obviously uh, you can't have stock of thousands of different parts. Here you have that freedom. A few examples of parts that were printed. Uh, the one big question we had was, is it possible to get to acceptable surface finish? Uh, we want, basically we want a perfect part. Uh, it can be printed, yes, but we want it to look just like it would look if it was done by a normal process. And you can't have any defect on a jewel that you're actually selling. So here you, you have a few examples of parts that were printed, rebinded and sintered and afterward polished by Tumbling. Uh, we actually outsourced that step because we're not expert here. And we were, to be honest, extremely surprised with the results. You get to mirror finished parts where you actually cannot see that this was actually a printed part. You can't guess it. You, you do not see any layers anymore. Uh, that, that's something that was quite a surprise for us. We're not sure we could get to that level of quality. Uh, and that's what shows uh, the last test we did. Uh, obviously, that's again available in, in black and white uh, and can be used for uh, jewelry, uh, some uh, other accessories. Here you can see some, uh, um, uh, some cufflinks. Uh, some people were uh, interested in printing uh, um, uh, some buckles or some other uh, parts for, um, uh, for different uh, usage, any kind of aesthetical part. You can also print parts that you could actually not make in any other way. Here you have an example of a bracelet, which is just not possible by another method. Um, <coughs> so that, that validation we had on, on the polishing, the possibility to polish those parts does open a few potential applications. Uh, and I think that's the last one, another uh, last example. We had quite a few request for passing fluid handling. Um, here the need is always uh, for ceramic material for a start. You need a wear resistant material, the corrosion resistant material. So you, you go for ceramic because of that. But the parts are quite complex. Uh, they are very difficult to produce, produce by injection molding. Uh, they could be machined, but that would make them extremely expensive and actually the customers are thinking about adding some more functionality in it, cooling channels or that kind of things, which would make it uh, completely impossible to make by another process. Can't show you the actual part, but here is an example of the kind of parts we can make. This is a, a, an, an impeller uh, that, that would be used in a pump, as a pump shaft. Um, this is the kind of part uh, our customer, uh, the kind of complexity, it's not exactly that shape, but. Uh, Unfortunately, we can't, can't show the, the actual part. It was made in Zikoina because it's chemically uh, and wear resistant. Um, it's also uh, quite tough and sometimes you, you do have a bit of mechanical strength needed here. Uh, and obviously, uh, uh, Zetamix enables production of very complex parts. And uh, that's also the interest. They started just by saying, we need that part in ceramic and why not make it by additive manufacturing to go into, oh, if I'm doing additive manufacturing, I could add this or that uh, feature. I could add some cooling circuit. I could add some uh, channels uh, for the fluid to, 
or in a different way. I could add some surfa surface patterning or whatever, some stuff that they would not do with traditional process. That's it. Uh, here is the, the long list of uh, uh, examples of application. Uh, I hope I didn't cost you too much uh, during this uh, presentation. The idea was really to give you an idea of the the large spectrum from tooling to spare parts to complex new parts, uh, the, the kind of applications we have uh, with that technology. <coughs> so I'm gonna try to answer your questions so obviously you can ask them if you have any um, new questions. I also want to uh, uh, let you know for those who are not uh, regular uh, of our webinars that this is part of a series. We are uh, making webinars every month, or maybe not in August because uh, there, there may be some summer holidays, but apart from that, every month uh, to try to give you some, some new information each time. So the, the next uh, will be on a completely different topic. We are, by the way, interested in your feedback. If you want us to talk about something in particular, you should let us know. You can put it in the Q&A or you can, you can let us know at some uh, uh, other time. Um, and we will try to feed you with some more information. We also uh, try to put some information on LinkedIn. Uh, so uh, we do advise you to follow us so that you can be informed about all of these. So to the question. Uh, the first question is why do you focus on oxide ceramics? Um, so that's a good point. <laughs> um, uh, are you planning to extend to silicon carbide, silicon nitride? Um, are you considering fiber reinforcements? Uh, well, <laughs> um, so everything of what you said is inter interesting to us. Uh, we started with oxide materials because these are the materials we actually produce in powders. We specialize in oxide. We started with these materials, and these are the ones where we have the most uh, maturity. The products have been uh, ready for more than two years now, so they work really well. Uh, and before launching all the products, we want to make sure we have the same level of control. Still, we are interested in silicon carbide and silicon nitride, uh, tungsten carbide, uh, and some metals also. Um, <clears throat> That's of interest. The, the next one on the list is supposed to be silicon carbide. We are working at the moment on silicon carbide. Um, and to, to for your next question, which is fiber reinforcement, that's also of great interest, but it becomes more complex. So I would say that's the next stage. Printing fiber reinforced ceramic would be great. We could also consider printing uh, continuous fiber uh, reinforced uh, materials, so uh, uh, ceramic matrix composites with ceramic fiber and ceramic uh, matrix, but this is extremely complex. Uh, so let's say one step at a time for the moment. It's something we have in mind. We discussed that with a few OEMs that could be interested, but uh, it's still uh, not for tomorrow. What is the level of reproducibility related to shrinkage in general? <laughs> that's that's a, a good question. Um, there's a few different things uh, you need to answer. Uh, I need to answer to, to say that. What I can tell is that on a given part, once we have found, found the right parameters for printing, dividing, sintering, we can hold the tolerances of plus minus 0.1 sometimes bit better if the part is relatively small, depends on the size, but let's say 0.1 uh, millimeter is easy, 100 micron. When we start with a new part, you may have surprises because we have you see shrinkage value, but if your part is very different, it's bigger, it has a very a strong uh, form factor, so it's very thin and very long or whatever, the shrinkage in XYZ might vary a little bit depending on the part. So for a new part, depending on the complexity, sometimes we do need a bit of trial and error. Um, to give you an example, uh, it's a relatively simple part, but the, 
the I have the values for the um, the thread guides we show you here. The first part, part we made, we were actually on some on the outer diameter. We were uh, at 0.2 millimeter, not 0.1. And so we printed a new part, and this one I fully expect to be in the range of 0.1 and maybe even less than that. And once you have that, you can repeat it and you have a variation in that range. Okay, I'm trying to go back to the questions. What are the smallest dimensions of channels that can be printed? Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm forced to answer quite often, that depends, and that's gonna be the case here. It depends on the printing orientation, is your channel in the C direction or X, Y? Uh, and it depends also a bit on the shape of the channel, if you want a perfect hole, round hole, or you can accept something which is not completely uh, spherical. Uh, in the, 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 the ideal case for us, uh, if you print with nozzle of 0.2, you could probably go to um, uh, channels down to 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters uh, of, um, of diameter. Uh, that, that is printable. The, the big interest with this technology is we don't have any, when we want a channel, we basically we, we, we don't put material at all. So we don't have any clean out to do, uh, which allows to make smaller uh, channels that if you had to clean out a slurry or whatever you have. Um, but does the 10K price include the whole system, printer, debining kit, furnace? Is your system compatible with other ceramic filaments? Um, so yes, it does include all of the, all of the parts, printer, debining, and furnace, a furnace which is compatible with metal and ceramic. Um, it would be compatible with other filaments. For the moment, there's not much on the market. <coughs> and to be completely clear, we try to be um, so good that you won't want to go somewhere else. We, we want to have the, the, the best possible filaments. That means the filament that we print in the easiest way and in the most reproducible way, uh, so that you will actually want to stick with us. And we also offer for those who want a different filament can also make some custom development. So if the question is, I want to do the same thing, but with the different materials, we would probably channel you to, well, let's work together. We can develop that for you. Is it possible to print in silicon carbide? Uh, in theory, yes. We haven't got yet a commercial product. We're expecting end of this year or in worst case in 2021 to have a commercial product. The one thing though is that silicon carbide requires much, much, much more uh, complex and equipment, uh, complex and expensive equipment, especially for the furnace. The furnace you need for silicon carbide needs to go to 2100 up to 2200 degrees C so we will not supply furnace compatible with that filament. So that's a, that's a limit. We need to find a furnace and it's, it's quite expensive. Um, so next question, can you please comment on how difficult it is to foresee the high shrinkage in the design stage such as to obtain accurate plane I mentioned after process. I'm referring to overall external volumetric shrinkage. <laughs> um, so that, that's a good question. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, that's not something we can be completely definite about. Uh, we, we do not have enough experience to tell you, is it going to shrink completely homogeneously each time or not? Uh, I can tell you on the path that we saw, for the moment, we did not have too much uh, surprises uh, related to uh, internal features versus outside dimensions. The main problem may more be uh, problems of distortion uh, during the shrinkage. So you typically, something which is quite hard to do is a perfectly flat surface. That's difficult. I'm not saying it can't be done. Of course we do that, 
but it's it's difficult to me make a long, large, very flat surface. That's difficult, and especially if you're printing it on the vertical, it's going to be very difficult to print it perfectly flat. Uh, so I would say the main problem is not necessarily external internal uh, dimensions. There may be some small variation, but that's very uh, reasonable and controlled. But uh, the risk of deformation is is an issue. So. Uh, question uh, regarding filters. Um, so working on filter design in both ceramic and polymer materials. <clears throat> the recommended brands are usually based on ceramic porous support materials with regular linear constant section. How does density translate to porosity? Um, um, so how does that work? Um, there's two, two types of porosity you can do. You can print porosity, of course. In that case, you, you're just going to print an infill, for instance, a grid, a geroid, whatever. You'll have a can of porosity, except that this porosity is relatively big. So it's going to be used if you want to filter big particles. If you want to filter with a very high filtration factor, uh, you are not going to use printing for that. You are more using printing to print channels in which, in which the flow of air is going to go through. And then uh, you will need the walls that you printed to be porous so that the air can go through it uh, and you will not want to control the porosity of this material. Uh, so porosity is basically uh, the uh, directly related to density. If you have a density of 100%, that means you don't have any porosity. Uh, so that does not mean you can't print porous parts. It does mean you need to control basically the sintering process. In the sintering process, you will start with a part which has a density of 50%. And during the shrinkage, you will go to a part that has a porosity of less than 1%. But you can stop in the middle of that process. You can stop at 60% density or at 70% density, which means 40 or 30% porosity. Um, uh, in which case you will still have that porosity, which is going to be very fine because it's more linked to the size of the particles inside uh, uh, the ceramic. So that's going to be quite small. Uh, so it's possible to print porous supports um, and the interest of 3D printing here will probably be to, instead of having, a re, as you say, regular and linear constant section, to have more complex shapes to improve uh, the, uh, the filtration efficiency. So basically the ratio between the, the, the loss uh, of uh, pressure you'll have, the pressure loss uh, in the filter, uh, and the efficiency of uh, filtration. Can 316L printed simultaneously with the coin of alumina? Uh, so it can be printed, but it's very difficult to sinter. <laughs> um, uh, so for the moment, we, 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 we can't uh, make multi materials. So we print alumina, the coin or 316L, but not the three of them together. Um, regarding sintering, it is available at outsourcing, of course. We, we do supply this a bit at the beginning. But for us, it's really um, the interest of this technology is that it makes uh, 3D printing of ceramic and metal easy, relatively cheap, fast. Uh, if you start outsourcing, well, uh, you're losing a part of the interest uh, for that. Uh, so it is available either at Nanui at, or at someone else, but on the long term, I don't feel that's really the philosophy of our uh, technology. And the last one about acetone recycling, uh, it does depend on the volume. If you have big volumes, you may want to recycle it internally. It's basically done by, um, uh, how do you call that, by boiling it and uh, uh, condensing it again. Um, uh, if the volumes are small, we usually advise you to uh, deal with a, a company who specialized in, in doing that. And that's quite a few ones. So it's quite easy to, to deal with that kind of stuff. 
uh, silicon carbide would be an excellent material for silicon detector cooling. I guess I know who that comes from. Uh, that's something we could uh, clearly discuss in the future if you want. Um, what is the composition of the ceramic filament? So uh, I'm not going to answer on the, the binder part because this is really where our novo is. And this is a patented technology. The patents are not public yet, so we don't communicate on that. Um, what I can say is that you have at least two, usually a bit more than that, components in the, the binding formulation, one which is soluble and the other not. And then you have the powder part, and the powder is the most important part. If you talk in volume, which is what you should do, uh, we usually have 50 to 60 volume percent of powder. Um, be careful, I'm talking in volume. Some people talk in mass, uh, which is a, a bit uh, misleading because uh, obviously the density of the ceramic being much higher, the figure in, in mass is high. Okay, so I, we have 80 to 90, sometimes 95% of powder in the filament. But that doesn't mean a lot. It depends on the density of the material. So in volume, 50 to 60%. Uh, do you have demo of ceramic FDM 3D printing? Absolutely, Parish, we, we do have some demo. Uh, we actually made a, a webinar where we did some live, uh, not live, but uh, some demo of uh, printing the binding cinturin, the full cycle to show. Um, it's not uh, online yet, but we are planning to put it in online. So uh, if that is, I will let you know. And again, if you follow us on LinkedIn, you will see that when it, when it comes. Um, and uh, <coughs> we may also do that webinar again in the future. What is the shelf life of the ceramic filament? Well, it depends uh, uh, if it's opened or not. The filaments are delivered in vacuum sealed package to protect them from humidity. We also advise you to be careful about high heat or high cold. Um, in that condition, it, it can last minimum of one year. Uh, we haven't tried more than that, but one year is easy. Um, uh, then once it's open, it's shorter than that. Uh, it's better to try to use it in one to two months. After that, it is still usable, but uh, the filament becomes more brittle, which is already the one defect of these filaments. They are relatively brittle. Well, they become more brittle, so they become more difficult to use. Have you done any sanding or polishing in the green state? Absolutely, we can do that. So we do it on some parts, it depends on what we want to obtain. Uh, we've tried sanding, sanding is a bit delicate because uh, we're always worried about breaking the part. So we usually do uh, polishing, which is manual polishing. So that's a problem because you add a manual step. Uh, but that, that has an interest if you really want to quickly remove the, 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 the layers uh, that you can see after the print. Um, again, it depends. If you see the parts we show you, the, the jewels, uh, some of them were not polished at all manually. We just printed them with very small layers and went directly to uh, uh, polishing after sintering. So it depends if you're anyway willing to polish it afterwards, uh, there's a trade-off to consider between uh, the time you're going to spend in manual labor versus the post polishing after sintering, which is completely uh, automatic. There's no manual labor involved. So that's an advantage. It's longer, but, but you're not uh, doing it yourself. So that, that's a good point. Uh, what is the typical cost of the material? Uh, materials range between five and 600 euro per kilo. There's some um, uh, uh, volume-based uh, incentive afterwards, but that's, that's a rough price. <coughs> uh, can 316L be sintered in the same furnace for ceramics? Yes, uh, it depends on the furnace you're using. Uh, we do offer a furnace which is compatible with both, which is a tube furnace. Uh, the big difference being that when we print 316L, we need to use 
um, um, some neutral gas, so, uh, argon or hydrogenated argon, uh, because if you don't do that, you will have oxidation. So to what extent the details of the printed parts are conserved after sintering? Um, I'm not sure we showed any very detailed part. I'm going to see if there are some. Um, this one is relatively detailed. Uh, so we, we don't have the more detailed parts on picture, so I'm going to answer, but without uh, showing these. Um, we need to make a small distinction between metal and ceramic. With ceramic, you can actually keep very small details. We've printed walls typically of uh, 200 microns, so after sintering, it's 150 microns, which came out of sintering perfectly. If you, if you manage to print them well, uh, sintering is not a problem. But it, it actually gives very fine details. Uh, the sintering at high temperature does not affect at all these details. For a simple reason, which is that even at 1500 degrees C, which is a sintering temperature of alumina, alumina is still uh, a hard material. It's not at all soft. It's not at all. So, so you keep the, the shape. It's also the reason why um, uh, when we print ceramic, if we need supports, we can remove them before sintering because they are not needed for sintering. The material will withstand the sintering without any support. Metal is slightly different because when you sinter metal, you actually need to get to a temperature where the metal is quite soft. And so very small details may be lost or at least a bit fuzzy. Uh, and, and, and you need support if you have overhangs. Yeah. What is costing most? Uh, 3D printing or post-processing, especially surface treatment? <laughs> And so it, again, it depends, it depends on the part. Uh, when we try to cut down costs uh, with the customers, we usually uh, find out that obviously the material is, is a part of the cost, but not the biggest one by far. The, the printer itself costs nothing if you print enough parts. Um, Post-processing, especially polishing, if you're doing it uh, if you add sources, it's not very expensive. So it's, um, it's, it's not the main issue. The main issue is time. So you still need, even though I, I told you it's, it's simple, you don't need super highly trained technician, but still you need someone to prepare the print, uh, to think about how should we, what printing strategy should we have. And then once it's printed, <coughs> to remove it, if you do a bit of manual finishing that takes time, um, and then to go through the whole step. And that's the main, the main issue, I think. It's, it's, it's still manual labor, uh, which is, uh, well, quite, quite a lot in the, the file prep, actually, also. Uh, we would like to be resellers. Well, uh, that's a simple thing. You, you need, uh, uh, to contact us, um, preferably by email. The email is uh, um, in, the, uh, in the presentation and anyway, we'll send you an email to all the participants uh, to send you the slides. Uh, we are looking for uh, resellers at the moment. So uh, uh, that is uh, of interest uh, for us. Um, we, we just need to discuss it. We need to know you better to know if it's relevant or not and to discuss uh, how we work with resellers. Is it necessary to have specific equipment to exhaust organic component tubes? So yes, thank you for that question. And the answer is yes. This is the one thing we do not provide. Uh, we ask the customer to install. You need some um, fume extraction <coughs> both for the furnace and also for the solvent, uh, uh, the solvent pass. Uh, it's not a big thing, you just need to extract it. Uh, there's no huge amount of binder, so you don't need to uh, post-treat it, you just need to extract it. Uh, and so you need some exhaust, yeah, absolutely. 
a question about glass ceramics. <laughs> yes, we're considering it, but there's so much material in that are interesting. Uh, it's, it's interesting, uh, we've seen a few applications where customers look for typically for low uh, CT materials, so uh, materials with a very little expansion coefficient, thermal expansion coefficient. Uh, and here, glass ceramics are interesting. So yes, yes, it's interesting. Um, for the moment, it's not on the top of the list uh, because we have a few materials that are shortlisted for the moment. And we also, um, uh, we also uh, work with customers here. So one of the drive is what we have decided as strategic materials. And the other drive is some customers come with the material and say, we really need that material. We're really to, ready to help you uh, in this development process. And, and so that also can speed up the development process. So for the moment, we haven't had that for glass ceramic, but obviously of interest. Can we print fully functional ceramic bearings? <laughs> um, so we've printed some bearings, it works. We have bearings, they're in ceramic, they work. Um, but compared to bearings made by, by other method, you will not reach the same level of quality and especially of tolerances. We can't print very, very, very tight tolerances. If we do that, there are some problems during printing or the binding and sintering. So we have relatively loose bearings. There may be a few applications, but if you compare it to the bearings you can see on the market, the ceramic bearings, it's not the same thing, really not. And uh, are, are you considering of developing a composition of alumina filament for supporting metal parts during printing? Um, <laughs> Um, we've looked into that. Uh, it's a question, to be honest, because for the moment we don't have any solution for supporting if the, if the part is not uh, too complex, we can sinter it directly. If it's a bit more complex, we sometimes use uh, what we call powder bed. So we use a ceramic powder bed. We just dip the part in, in powder. Um, but yes, it would be interesting for more complex uh, parts. What exists on the market is usually not uh, printing the supports in alumina. It's actually printing the supports in metal and printing just a few layers uh, between the support and the material uh, in, and the part in ceramic. <coughs> There's a reason for that, which is it's difficult to have an alumina filament which has exactly the same shrinkage as the stainless steel one. Uh, so it's a thought. Uh, it is of interest, but uh, not on the short term. Uh, if we need to print the hollow cube of three millimeter diameter and length of 100 centimeter, one meter, am I correct? Uh, <laughs> so you, you, you can print it, you just need a big printer. Uh, the question is how is it gonna look like after sintering are you going to have any deformation or not? Honestly, we have never, ever tried that. The biggest printer we're using it actually has a, a, a Z axis of uh, 60 centimeter. Uh, so it's a bit small. And, and there's really a question of, of is it a geometry uh, that is relevant uh, um, uh, to be printed? Is there not another process that would do that in a better way? And do we need to put some support in the inner part and how do we clean the same? I would really need to see the part here. Uh, is it just a hollow tube uh, or is it more than that? Um, potentially we could print without support because the part is relatively small. Uh, the thickness is, is not so, so much. Uh, but again, 100 centimeter is a lot. So. I don't know, to be, to be tested. Um, do you support new customers on designing their production model, including all different costs? That's not something we do. Uh, we, we really are 
material manufacturer. So we do supply the equipment, we do supply some training, but that's where we stop. If a customer needs some, some guidelines on designs for uh, ceramic AM, yes, we will help, but we won't go to actually playing with the designs. That's the customer job. And if you need some help, there are some amazing companies making great software. Some of them are French, so we can uh, go and see them. Uh, is there a limitation for the wall thickness? Yes, thank you for that question also. The, the, the limitation is similar to what you will have with SLA because, because it comes for the same reason, which is debinding. If you want to debind very thick parts, it's, it's difficult. Um, so yes, we have that limitation. Depending on the material, we can sometimes do a bit more than six millimeter thanks to the chemical binding, but still there is that limitation. Uh, we actually look at that with customers and most of the cases, the customer don't actually need a fully dense wall of more than six millimeters. So what we do is we print the wall they want even if it's 30 millimeter, but the inside is gonna be hollowed out. It's gonna be a honeycomb pattern or a geroid pattern or whatever that makes it not fully dense. And that kind of structure can be, even if it's fully closed, it can be printed by the density. Any specific bed adhesion requirements? Not really. We've been printing with a lot of different surfaces, uh, glass plates, uh, flexible plates, anything that, that's, that's not one of the main issue we have with this material. Uh, how can we achieve 1800 degrees C temp in venturi burn or showing the PBT? So in, in that case, we did not go to 1800. I was just saying the material can withstand 1800. Uh, obviously the temperature of the part itself was much lower uh, I'm not very familiar with the temperature of the, um, of the piece itself, but uh, uh, I'm just saying alumina can withstand that kind of temperature uh, while still retaining relatively good mechanical uh, strength. Uh, is it possible to mix white and black? <laughs> um, uh, we've, we've been playing a bit with that. Uh, it's complex um, and uh, for the moment I would say we, we managed to make a few uh, parts uh, with two colors, but we have problems of contamination between the black and the white. So the black is not really black, the white is not really white. So for the moment I would say no. Um, Uh, so the question about the maximum volume percent ceramic load that can be achieved. <coughs> and the maximum we've achieved, I think it's something like 65 uh, volume percent. But as you say, it does depend a lot on the material, the particle size, uh, the, the binder formulation also. Uh, usually we're more in the range of 50, 55, sometimes 60, but more 50, 55. Do you do sintering in-house? Of course, I mean, uh, we can't be serious about uh, uh, offering a 3D printing technology for ceramic if you don't sinter parts, so that, that's not reasonable. So yes, we do some sintering, of course. Uh, how do you deal with the binding cracks, shrinkage and deformation? Uh, that's that's one of the main issues, uh, cracks during the binding uh, um, and deformation. Shrinkage is something which, again, for ceramic manufacturer is normal. I mean, having a 20% shrinkage, even if you do ceramic injection molding, pressing, whatever, you'll have the same shrinkage. Um, so uh, that's... Um, Shrinkage is okay. So the cracks and deformation are the two issues. Cracks for a start, well, basically the simple answer is uh, you need to stay in reasonable designing guidelines. We can't print very big parts or if you do so, it's difficult. You need to avoid high sickness. You need to avoid uh, straight angles. 
you need to avoid a big variation in thickness. And if you respect that kind of design rules, you usually don't have too much price. It's still ceramic, so sometimes you do have a surprise. Uh, but um, we can avoid most problems by respecting those design guides, design rules. Regarding deformation, um, uh, same goes here. If you respect the right design rules, you usually get um, some acceptable uh, deformation, but we do have some deformation. I'm not going to deny that. Uh, and typically making, as I said, a very flat, big flat surface is difficult. And that's, that's, that's also true for other ceramic process. And regarding dimensional accuracy, the dimensional accuracy I was talking about was including sintering. So for the final part, when I say plus minus 0.1, that's for the final part. Uh, does preheat the filament require before 3D printing? The answer is no, we don't preheat the filament. We, we actually prefer to keep them at room temperature and it's even better if you can have air conditioned room because that means you always have exactly the same temperature. Can we print biocompatible ceramics like hydroxyapatite for fabricating body hard tissues? So the first answer is uh, Alumina and Zikonia are biocompatible ceramics. They are used uh, for dental applications. They are used for uh, hip and articulation prosthesis. So those materials are already printable. Could we print hydroxyapatite? I would say probably yes, but this is a very different material. We're really not experts in that material, so it's, it's not in our list for the moment. <clears throat> well, I think that's all for the question. I'm just gonna check if there are some others on the, sometimes there are a few on the chat. Um, I'm gonna try to see if there are some questions unanswered. It seems, uh, <clears throat> Well, uh, there's a few uh, information, but not, nothing that would be any questions. Anyway, if you have any question um, about, um, about what you just saw, you can also send us any email with inquiries. You will definitely receive an email from someone from the team, me or someone, or someone else, uh, with the slides and offering you to maybe have a call in the next week to see if there's any uh, project uh, uh, yes. where you may need uh, that kind of technology. So again, thank you very much for following that webinar um, and uh, uh, we'll remain uh, available if you have any questions. Thank you very much.